right. Good morning and welcome. This is uh, week three of The Life of Jesus Christ. Uh, and as a reminder for this particular course, uh, this is a, uh, a biblical studies course that is uh, given to students that are not biblical studies majors. Okay. Uh, they are uh, uh, business administration majors at the bachelor's level. And uh, so I don't assume that anybody knows really anything about the Bible or the New Testament or Jesus. It's a very introductory course, but of course it's uh, taught at the college level, at the university level. Uh, so everything is very uh, simple and basic at an introductory level. Uh, people are, you're free to ask questions. If you don't know something, then ask, because I want to help you. I want to help you to understand what's actually taking place here. And of course, I also have a, a very strong policy that you should have, um, you should have academic freedom to ask questions, uh, to, to disagree with the teacher respectfully, and that uh, you should have the ability to be curious and to follow the evidence wherever you think the evidence leads. So uh, your grade in this course is not going to be contingent upon accepting all of the opinions that I have. Um, you might actually see the evidence differently. That's okay. That's fine. Because uh, I am not perfect. I make mistakes, and I certainly don't know everything that there is to know. Um, you know, I'll, I'll learn new things as I go along. Uh, but I have been studying the Bible uh, from an academic standpoint uh, for the last 20 years. So I, I know a little bit. So, okay. Uh, so this week we are looking to um, uh, move from the expectations of the Messiah. That's what we talked about last week. We looked at um, how uh, how Judaism and the Old Testament uh, set out these expectations of the Messiah and what he was supposed to look like, what his lineage was supposed to come from, what is his role, what are his job responsibilities, and of course, what is his relationship to the God of Israel. And uh, so once we move to the New Testament, uh, particularly when we look at our four Gospels, our four um, ancient biographies of the life of Jesus, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, we will start to see how they uh, they shape and they frame Jesus as their main character. Uh, but in doing so, uh, those authors expect that you already know the expectation of the Messiah, and then they just say Jesus is this coming Messiah. So uh, you, you, you need to know what that, um, the Messianic, job description actually is. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to go in the order in which uh, probably uh, the uh, the Gospels are written. Uh, we talked about in our first lecture that uh, even though um, our, our New Testament uh, begins with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, that's probably not the chronological order in which the books were written. And, and by the difference in chronology, we're talking you know, 10, 15 years at max, you know, for documents that are 2000 years old, that's nothing. That's like, you know, that's small stuff. However, um, it is also clear that, uh, that, that some of the gospels, uh, have used other gospels as kind of their template and they've kind of built upon them. So they're not all completely independently attested. So, uh, we're, so we're going to start with the gospel of Mark because Mark was probably the earliest gospel that was written. It's also the shortest gospel. And uh, our goal today is to look at um, the birth of Jesus and also his early life, okay? Um, not getting too far into things, um, and we're going to see that each gospel um, is going to give uh, varying amounts of attention to the birth of Jesus and to his, his early life and his early ministry. Uh, and then in the next week, we'll begin to look at uh, probably the most important part of the ministry of Jesus is that as an adult, uh, Jesus was an evangelist. He was a preacher of the gospel. Uh, particularly, he was a preacher of the good news about the kingdom of God. Um, and that is an extremely important part of the life of Jesus that gets um, strangely neglected um, in church circles. So we're going to, you know, just obviously when you're going to start by looking at biographies, you start at their birth. So uh, I'll begin by by sharing my screen. Oops, that's not the button that I want. Okay. All right. 
Um, everybody's able to see the uh, see the text in front of them. Okay, uh, is the font on the text is it big enough that people can read? If it's not, like, let me know, and I can we could try to fix that. But I try to make it a little bit bigger. Um, okay, so we're beginning with Mark uh, again. Mark is the shortest gospel. It's also the um, it is the uh, the the earliest gospel that was written chronologically. Okay, um, and and Mark was probably written. We'll just say either slightly before the year 70 or maybe a few years after. So like maybe sometime between like maybe 65 and 75. That time period is important um, because in the year 70, um, uh, during the Jewish revolt, uh, they revolted against the Roman Empire and they began what's called the Jewish War. That began in the year 66. Um, and Rome and Rome's armies uh, surrounded Jerusalem, cut off all supply uh, of food and water, and uh, eventually Rome's armies were able to knock down the walls of the city that were those walls are basically protecting Jerusalem, and they were to come in and to conquer the entire city, and they were able to destroy the Jerusalem temple. Uh, so that's the major event that happened in the year 70. Uh, and there are some indications in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, that uh, will point us in that direction. They'll say, like, you know, this is happening around that particular time period. Um, so, so we're talking uh, again. If, if Jesus died um, around the year thirty, and this is written around the year, you know, let's just say around the year seventy, we're talking forty years after uh, the life of Jesus. But what has become clear um, is that uh, the the stories of Jesus continued to circulate orally. They would tell stories about Jesus. They would remember stories about Jesus. Uh, they would recount them. And that was the culture that they lived in. They lived in a culture that was an oral culture. Um, and, and that was important because, um, uh, well, our culture is a little bit different. Our culture thinks that things need to be in writing in order for them to be authentic. And things that are just kind of said don't hold much weight uh, because things that are said can be forgotten. They could be changed. But things in writing, those are secure. Uh, they didn't think that way in the ancient world uh, because most people in the ancient world didn't have enough education to read and write. At the height of the ancient world, in the most educated city, which was Athens, um, the percentage of people that could read and write was 5%. 5% of the world was able to read and write at the top of, of their um, educational quality. So 5% is one out of 20 people. So assume one person out of this class would be able to read and write. Everyone else can't. So writing in their culture was not considered authoritative because most people couldn't read. Most people couldn't read it. Um, but since, but everybody was sharing these stories. And so, you know, if everyone was sharing a story and one person changed the details of it, or if one person forgot some of the details of it, everyone else could say, no, that's not how the story goes. You have everyone else to kind of keep the checks and balances. So. We have for many years, 40 years, that the stories and the sayings and the teachings and the life of Jesus, those things are circulating orally uh, in various communities. And then Mark is able to take the time to actually put them into writing. OK, so so that's kind of what's going on here. OK, now um, Mark begins, as you can see here, um, he says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. So a couple of interesting things here. First of all, um, uh, this, this is just kind of a, a title for his particular book. And he is actually the very first person to uh, describe a biography of an ancient person as a gospel. Okay. Now, in, in Christian vernacular, the gospel is the good news. It is the spoken message. It's the message that a preacher preaches to people. It is the good news that if people accept the message, understand it, and they believe it, then they become converted to Christianity. Uh, so what Mark is actually doing is he's saying, um, yes, there is a spoken message, but I'm going to describe the entirety of this ancient biography of Jesus as gospel. Okay? So in other words, he is taking a term that means the spoken good news, and now he's applying it to an ancient Greco-Roman biography. And this indicates that the entire contents of the Gospel of Mark is something that should be preached 
and believed in order to be converted to Christianity. You see the logic of that? You see how that works? It goes from uh, a spoken message, the good news that people would believe, to something that Mark uses to describe the entirety of the, uh, the ancient biography of Jesus. And of course, in this biography, we're going to see Jesus himself actually preaching the gospel. Okay? So um, this, this will be important uh, next week when we actually get to defining what that gospel actually is. And of course, Mark tells us that, hey, who is our subject? Our subject is Jesus. Uh, Jesus is uh, the, the given human name to Jesus, you know, Jesus' mother, Mary. You probably know that Mary is the mother of Jesus. Uh, she gave him that name, okay? Uh, so in Hebrew, uh, his name would be uh, Yeshua, which um, is, is actually the same name as Joshua. There's a famous character in the Old Testament named Joshua. He has an entire book uh, named after him. He's kind of the, uh, the successor of Moses. And, uh, and, and Joshua has, has the same name, um, Yeshua. That's, that's how you would pronounce it in Hebrew. Uh, so Jesus' name is the same as Joshua, okay? Uh, G Jesus is kind of like this English way that we've kind of uh, rendered it. Uh, in Greek, uh, it's the word uh, Yesus. Okay, so you got Yeshua, you got Yesus. It doesn't really matter to me how you say it. Um, the English way we just say it is uh, Jesus. That's fine. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, I, I don't think it, it matters so much like how you say the name. Uh, of course, it's just it's said differently in different different languages, as you all probably are aware. I Many of you speak multiple languages. Okay, but also it's not just Jesus. Uh, Mark is, is quite clear at the beginning what he believes and what he's going to tell you in his gospel. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. Remember, Christ is the title for the anointed king. So Jesus is the king. He's the anointed king. What is Jesus the anointed king of? Well, kings are kings of kingdoms. That much is clear. That's that's. I mean, to, to, to claim to be a king in the ancient world means that you are the ruler, the monarch over a realm and a territory that's called a kingdom. That much is clear. Okay, so Mark wants you to believe that. And of course, he expects that you already understand what Christ means. That's why we spent two lectures talking about that. And of course, he is the son of God. Now, son of God, we, we looked at uh, also is a title for the Jewish king. Okay. And um, of course, it, it indicates that this king has a special relationship with the God of Israel. Okay. Uh, it, it, of course, if Jesus is the son of God, what does that make God? If Jesus is the son of that God, then that God is the father. I mean, that much is clear. Okay. Obviously, um, you know, if you are you are the the, the child uh, of of your father, you would say, "I am the son or the daughter of of so and so." Uh, that of course uh, indicates that um, you have a familial relationship uh, with the person um, of whom you are a son or a daughter. Okay, so so Mark is quite clear. Jesus is this anointed King of the Kingdom. He is the Son of God, which again is another title emphasizing that he is the Messiah. Christ, of course, means Messiah. Okay, um, now. One of the things that we'll notice with Mark is that Mark does not talk about the birth of Jesus. He has nothing to say about it. Okay? Uh, and there's been a lot of speculation about this. Um, did Mark not know about the birth of Jesus? Did Mark uh, not have access to materials or to stories and sayings about the birth of Jesus? We just don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to make an argument when there's uh, no evidence. You, you know, arguments... Um, uh, from the lack of evidence, uh, tend to not be very persuasive. All we know is that Mark uh, felt comfortable writing his gospel, his biography of Jesus, um, without telling us about the birth of Jesus. Okay, so uh, Mark begins um, by indicating that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. So Mark says this. Um, well, he started off by saying that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Uh, and then he he quotes something that Isaiah says, uh, "Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness: Make ready the way of the Lord; make his path paths straight." Okay. Um, now, in this particular translation, when they put all those words in caps, they're not yelling at you. That is just indicating to you that they're quoting from the Old Testament. That's what that means. Okay. Um, which is interesting because actually in the in the Greek language, 
in which the New Testament was written, uh, they did not have uh, the differentiation between uppercase letters and lowercase letters. Uh, we today have uh, that differentiation um, in, in, in many languages, especially English. Uh, but in their culture, like if you look at the, the, the Greek manuscripts, they're all in uppercase and they're all actually connected together. So uh, anyway, but the, that's what it means here when the text is putting everything in uppercase. Okay, so we're seeing that there's a prophecy about someone coming ahead as a messenger who is preparing the way. Um, and uh, this way, of course, is not just kind of like the way you're going to go. A way is a road and a path. Okay, it's, it's a very specific type of way. Uh, and you can see here as the passage continues, it's to make the paths straight. Okay, preparing the way of the Lord is not just kind of the general direction in which they're going to go. The way is the road and the path. And so someone is going to come ahead to prepare the way for Jesus. Okay, and then what do we see? What does the text tell us? It tells us John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness. And what was he doing? He was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so there's a lot of information there uh, that I don't want to just assume that you know. Okay, so you got this guy named John. Okay, and and he is called the Baptist. Okay, uh, it, literally in Greek, he is John the one baptizing. Okay, what does it mean to baptize? To baptize someone means to take them and to dip them into water. That's what it means to baptize. Okay, uh, so John was this guy that. Uh, was known because that's what he does. He he goes around and he 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 dunks people in water, okay. Uh, and so he gets this nickname, John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, okay. Um, and and what is he doing? Uh, he is out there preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so he is he he is functioning as a preacher. Um, he is telling people they need to get baptized, and in doing so, they need to repent. Um, uh, the word. Um, uh, repent in Greek, uh, uh, metania, um, means to change your mind. Repentance means to change your mind. Because if you change the way that you think, you're going to change the way that you behave. Okay? And so repentance means to change the way that you think about living sinfully, about not living in alignment with God's standards and God's ways, and of course, turning your life to live in accordance with God's uh, standards and God's words. Okay. And uh, it seems here that John the Baptist was able to offer the forgiveness of sins for those who responded appropriately to this repentance and who submitted to this baptism. Okay. So John's kind of the big deal because because uh, at this time period, nobody was baptizing. Okay. At least not in, in the capacity that John was. Okay. I mean, he he was baptizing people so frequently that he gets this nickname. He's John the Baptizer. So Baptist is not his last name. Uh, he's not a Baptist in the sense of like the modern uh, Protestant denomination. Um, he's John the Baptizer because that's what he does. He dips people in water um, for the forgiveness of sins if they repent and they submit to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, what do we learn about John? Um, all the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Okay, so so John um, is not a fringe prophet. Uh, John is someone that gets a, a large following. A lot of people are coming out uh, to him. They're they're um, they are uh, committing themselves in repentance. And of course, um, Mark is telling you that John is just a messenger. John is preparing the way for someone who is coming afterwards. Okay. Um, we learned a little bit about John. He was uh, clothed in camel's hair. He wore a leather belt around his waist. His diet was locust and wild honey. Um, so that's uh, that actually is a reference to a, a previous character in the Old Testament. It's not really relevant for our study right now. It's just some interesting details about him. Uh, and what does John say? And he was preaching and saying, so this is what he would be customarily telling people. He says, after me, one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. Okay, so John is again indicating that he is aware that he is a messenger, and he's like, the person who's coming after me, he is much mightier than I am. Okay, John says that I'm baptizing you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Okay, 
And then what do we see? In those days, we learn who that person is. Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. Okay? So that's very interesting. It, it, it gives the impression that, um, that Jesus uh, actually agreed with John's message, um, and, and he submitted to that in baptism. Now, um, the fact that Mark begins his gospel um, with the baptism of Jesus by John is actually really important because all four gospels are going to begin the ministry of Jesus, not his birth, but, but when Jesus is, is an adult, he's a functioning adult here, probably like in his early 30s. Um, they are all going to say that Jesus' ministry begins with Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. Okay. Why is that? Why is that important? Well, we're going to see. Okay. It's actually, it's actually a pretty big deal. Okay. So, so Jesus is getting baptized by John. What actually happens during that event? Okay. Uh, immediately coming up out of the water, he, Jesus, saw the heavens opening. Okay. Uh, and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. Okay. So there's this, um, and actually the, 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 um, the, the verb that's being used here for the heavens opening is much more violent. It's like the heavens are being like ripped open. Okay. Uh, it's the same verb that's used later in the gospel of the, uh, the veil of the temple being ripped. Okay. It's not just an open, like my door opened, no big deal. Uh, no, it's a much more drastic, violent, but it also, um, it, it indicates to like, if, if heaven is being open, then access to God becomes available. And what are we going to see? We're going to see that, of course, the Spirit comes down. You know, God sends the Spirit upon Jesus, and we're going to hear a voice from heaven. Okay, verse 11. And a voice came out of the heavens. And what did that voice say? You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Okay, so um, that voice clearly is God. Okay, and so we can see at the baptism of Jesus, unlike all the other baptisms, that John the Baptist performed, this one got this massive visible sign where the heavens were open, Jesus receives the Spirit, and then a voice from heaven says, you are my son, you are my son, okay? Remember, what does son of God mean? What does it mean that Jesus is the son of God? To be the son of God means you are the Messiah. It means you are the Christ, you are uh, the, the Jewish king. Okay, and so the baptism of Jesus um, functions, and this is really important. The baptism of Jesus functions as his anointing ceremony to be the Messiah, to be the King. Remember, the Messiah. The word Messiah means one who is anointed. Okay, and so we see Jesus uh, as he's baptized in water. He receives the Spirit. So, like, is he anointed with water? Is he anointed with the Spirit? Is it a little bit of both? Um, but the text makes very clear that, um, that that God publicly points to Jesus and says, this guy is the Son of God. This guy is the Messiah. This guy is the Christ. Okay? That's, that's, and that's why Mark begins his gospel um, with the baptism of Jesus. Okay? Because, it, because it's, it's, Jesus is you know, not just any other guy. Um, before he can even do anything in his ministry, he has to be publicly declared to be to be the Messiah, and 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 who is more um, appropriate to point to Jesus and say that Jesus is the Son of God than God Himself? Okay, so that's that's really important. And what we're going to see is that uh, framing uh, the beginning of Jesus' career with his baptism, in which he is publicly pointed out to be the Son of God, to where he's anointed as the messiah publicly for everyone to see okay it's not it's not something that was done kind of privately you know we're no i mean like tons and tons of people are coming out from jerusalem and judea it's not something that's that happens privately in some sort of room or in some sort of house this is it's public it's out there anyone can see this and then people have to decide um you know do they want to take this jesus person seriously i mean god himself pointed and said you're you're the son of god um, or are they going to ignore him? Okay, but all the gospels are going to begin the ministry of Jesus by uh, by talking about this baptism 
and, and pointing out that in the baptism, Jesus is publicly declared to be God's son. And remember, son of God is a title for the Jewish king, for the Messiah, for the Christ. Okay. Um, and then from there, Mark actually continues and uh, begins talking about the ministry of Jesus. Now that he is appropriately designated for us, the reader, as the Jewish Messiah, uh, Mark can continue that story. Uh, but Mark doesn't tell us anything about Jesus' birth, uh, Jesus' lineage. He doesn't say anything about that, at least not here. Um, we do learn uh, later in the Gospel of Mark that, Mark that Jesus is the son of David. Okay, He made a big deal about this. That, um, to be that that David in the Old Testament was promised that his descendants would possess the Davidic throne forever, they would possess the kingdom forever, and they would be able to have this house, this dynasty lasting forever. So the heir of the Davidic dynasty is someone who's going to rule on David's throne, that is the throne of the Jewish king in Jerusalem, and they're going to possess the kingdom forever, okay? Uh, and so Jesus is actually labeled uh, appropriately as the son of David later in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, but for today's purposes, that's all that we need to look at in regard to Mark. So again, what you need to know is that Mark Mark does not tell us about the birth of Jesus. Okay, um, But Mark just kind of begins by um, noting the baptism of Jesus. Uh, John the Baptist was a forerunner for this, preparing the way. Uh, John was baptizing Jesus, submitted to that baptism. And at the baptism, there was this public announcement, you know, the big, you know, God got on the PA, uh, spread open the heavens and announced to um, the reader. I mean, the reader knows. And now God, of course, declares that Jesus is the son of God. OK, um, so actually in Mark, you've now been told that Jesus is the son of God twice. It's already been said at the very beginning in the first verse. And now, uh, so, so Mark tells you that Jesus is the Son of God. And then we learn in the 11th verse that God himself declares Jesus the Son of God. Okay? Uh, any questions about Mark before we move on to Matthew? Am I doing okay? All right. Okay. So, why do we start with Mark and then we move to Matthew? Because Matthew... Uh, when he was writing his gospel, he used the gospel of Mark as a source, as like his rough draft. Okay, 90% of the gospel of Mark has been maintained in the gospel of Matthew. But Matthew had access to, uh, to more stories of Jesus. We're going to see that Matthew had a lot of uh, access to stories about Jesus' birth that Mark either didn't have or didn't put into his gospel. And um, of course, Matthew has quite a lot uh, of information that Mark does not have. And so uh, Matthew's is much larger. So Mark is 16 chapters. Matthew is 28 chapters. Okay. Um, so because Matthew used Mark as a source, we know that Mark went first and um, Matthew came after that. Okay. Um, Matthew was probably written around maybe 10 years, 15 years after uh, the Gospel of Mark was written. So we're, you know, around the year like 80, 85. Um, these are just scholarly guesses. Of course, nobody knows for sure. So, but it's just, we're, we're basing it on, on the tiniest details that, uh, you know, we're doing the best that we have. Okay. Uh, so we talked about this a little bit that Matthew, uh, does talk about the birth of Jesus. Okay. Anyone who, uh, is a Christian that, that celebrates Christmas, uh, and celebrates Advent, they get a lot of stories, um, in the opening chapters of Matthew. Now, uh, Matthew begins by, uh, by offering us what's called a genealogy. A genealogy uh, traces the particular subject all the way back in their family uh, ancestry uh, to their, their forefathers, okay? And uh, Matthew does this, as we see, because Matthew wants to prove to you that Jesus is a descendant of David and a descendant of Abraham, okay? So he begins by saying, uh, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So uh, like Mark, Matthew thinks that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed king, uh, and of course, also the son of David and the son of Abraham. Okay. Uh, now, son of David, of course, indicates that Jesus is the heir of those Davidic promises, uh, the, uh, the throne of Jerusalem that's going to be established forever, the kingdom that's going to be established forever, and a dynasty that's going to be established forever. All three of those things uh, were covenanted to David and promised to David's descendants. 
the son of Abraham uh, goes back even further uh, because Abraham was uh, selected by God um, to bless the world. And by blessing the world, that means to undo the sin of Adam. Okay, blessings undo curses, uh, according to Genesis chapter 12. Okay, uh, so Jesus is going to bring about the blessing uh, to all the world. Uh, he is a uh, he's a descendant of Abraham, uh, and he's also a descendant of David. So Jesus uh, is a Jew, very very clearly. Now, um, a lot of people don't like to read through this genealogy because it's a bunch of names, and let's face it, names names are kind of boring. Okay, um, but for the Jewish people, it wasn't just listing a bunch of names. This is the genealogy of God's people, and the story of how God works with His people is like the story of the Bible. So it's not just a bunch of names that are listed. I mean, if you were to give me your genealogy, I'm sure it's very important to you, but it wouldn't be that meaningful to me. Uh, the difference here is that the genealogy of Jesus retells the story of the Old Testament, and that's the story of God working with, with His people. So it's a story of God, how God has been interacting with His people for a long time. So that's why it's a big deal. Okay. Um, so Matthew gives like 16 verses of talking about, uh, the genealogy. Okay. Um, and, uh, and it, it's, it's kind of repeated. It's, um, you know, it's, it's uh, like in Greek, it says, Avraham, a Yenison, ton, um, uh, Isaac. That means Abraham, uh, uh, begat or became the father of Isaac and Isaac, uh, and it just, it just continues that, you know, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat uh, Judah uh, and his brothers. Uh, it's just kind of a rough translation of the Greek, but basically that's what the English says. And it just does that over and over with about 40 names and just goes down the line. But it begins with Abraham because it, we have to prove that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And you can see as, as, it, as, the, um, as the passage continues down, we actually have, um, down in verse 6, we have Jesse as the father of David. And something is interesting about David. He's actually called David the king. It's reminding you that, hey, David is this king. And the king has all these promised descendants uh, so that if Jesus is the son of David, he's to be the heir of all of those promises. Okay. And then it goes on from David to Solomon. Um, and just, it just continues to go down all the way until you get uh, to Jesus. Now. Um, when it gets to the father of Jesus, that's where the genealogy changes a little bit. Okay. Um, it says, uh, so we've moved all the way down to the end of the list. Verse 16, uh, it says, uh, uh, Jacob was the father of Joseph, who was the husband of Mary by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Okay. So they're very, very careful. Matthew's very careful to not say that Joseph was the father of Jesus. He says Joseph was the husband of Mary, and Jesus came out of Mary. Uh, so the English here says um, Mary, by whom Jesus was born, uh, but in the Greek uh, it, it uses uh, the preposition ek, where we actually get the, the word exit. You know what exit is? It means that's the place where you go out. So, um, so we have Mary out of whom Jesus was born. Jesus came out of Mary. Okay. Um, that's, that's the, um, the purpose of that. Okay. So, so Matthew's clear that, that Joseph is not the father of, of, uh, of Jesus. Uh, Mary is the mother, uh, but Jesus has to have a father. Okay. So what's, what's, what's going to happen? Okay. Um, so uh, there's kind of a summary in verse 17. All the generations from Abraham to David are 14, from David to the deportation to Babylon, that's 14, and then from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, uh, 14 generations, okay? So it kind of shows like, hey, we've got from these from these major figures, from Abraham, kind of the, the founder of the, the faithful people of God, all the way to David, who is the pivotal king, that's a big, nice, uh, round number. Um, they also kind of understood like seven is the number of perfection and completion, uh, cause God, um, you know, create the earth in seven days. So seven's kind of a number of perfection. So if you double it, uh, then you have uh, a double sense of perfection. So you've got this kind of sense of perfection and symmetry according to the plans and purposes of God going from Abraham all the way to Jesus. Uh, but it gives the high points. It gives Abraham and then David, and it gives the low points of their history, 
uh, the, the Babylonian exile, which happened in 587 BC. And then from the Babylonian exile uh, to the Messiah, we have 14 uh, generations. Okay. Now he's going to give you some more. From, we've moved, we're moving away, starting at verse 18. We're moving away from a list of names to birth narratives. We're now going to give a narrative of the birth of Jesus. Okay. So this is what Matthew says. Matthew says, now the birth of Jesus was as follows. Okay. Uh, and we have this English word birth, uh, but in Greek, uh, the noun is genesis. What, what word does that sound like? The word genesis in Greek is where we get the English word genesis. Okay. So you could, you could translate this. Now the genesis of Jesus Christ was as follows. What does genesis mean? Genesis means beginning. Genesis means creation. Okay. So here is where Matthew's telling us, here is where, the way that Jesus began. Here is the genesis of Jesus. It's the beginning and the birth of Jesus. Birth is fine. You could translate as birth. That's fine. Okay. So it's going to say, this is how it happened. Okay. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So um, before. Um, Mary and uh, they're, they're betrothed, which means kind of like they're, they're, they're engaged to be married. They're not yet married. Um, and of course, they have not yet uh, known each other intimately. Uh, but Mary finds out she's pregnant. Okay. And she is, um, she, well, she, she's found to be with child uh, by the Holy Spirit. Okay. This is not a, a sexual type of term. It's not that the Holy Spirit had sex with Mary or anything like that. Um, the Spirit. Uh, functions in the Bible kind of as this creative power of God, the creative presence of God. Um, when, when God sends the Spirit, um, there is often uh, the sense of uh, creation that actually takes place. Okay, so um, how does it go? Uh, Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Now, why would Joseph do this? Well, um, you know, because uh, adultery in their culture was something that was punishable by stoning. Okay, if you're an adulterer, uh, that that's that's a cap, that's a a sin that, that has a capital punishment. And so Joseph doesn't want to disgrace her. He doesn't want you know the person he's engaged to to um uh, to be killed this way. He's just like I'm just gonna I'm gonna dismiss her. We're gonna do it privately. I'm gonna do it secretly because I don't want anything bad to happen to her. Okay, and then something happens to Joseph. Verse twenty. When he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Okay? We need to talk about this. Okay? One of the things that you're going to notice here is that the perspective of Jesus' birth in the Gospel of Matthew is not actually from the perspective of the wife. It's actually from the perspective of Joseph, and you, you do need to know that. That is an important point, is that uh, Matthew tells the birth of Jesus from the perspective of, of Joseph, not of Mary. Okay, You do need to know that, because uh, when we look at the Gospel of Luke, we're going to see it a little bit differently. Okay, So Matthew's from the perspective of Joseph. Okay, So... Um, uh, this 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 heavenly visitor. That's what an angel is. And the word angel means messenger. Okay, it's it's an angelic messenger, a messenger from God, a heavenly messenger. That's what an angel means. It means a messenger. Okay, um, and so it appeared to him in a dream. Okay, and says, um, "Don't be afraid." Uh, and then he explains what happened. You know, did did Mary get knocked up? Did Mary get raped? Did something happen? But 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 the angel indicates something. Uh, that that tells about how uh, Mary became pregnant with Jesus. Okay, um, this is the child who had been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, now this might be some technical language, but um, the uh, the the mother, when a mother has a child, she conceives a child. Uh, the input of the father, the father begets a child. Okay. Um, but but the verb that's being used here is is not just a basic word for being conceived. It means to be begotten. It means to bring someone into existence. 
Okay. The child who has been begotten, who has been brought into existence in Mary, is of the Holy Spirit. As in, the Holy Spirit has kind of functioned as this creative force to create Jesus in Mary. Okay? These aren't sexual terms. These are kind of creation terms. And, and, and of course, the Holy Spirit is, of course, uh, indicating that the God is, is interacting um, with his creative spirit. And this, of course, makes God the father of Jesus. You know, who is, I mean, who is Jesus' father? Not Joseph. I mean, the text is very clear to say Joseph is not the father, but it's trying to explain how Jesus was born. God is the father of Jesus. And his miraculous creation, his miraculous birth, uh, happens in this particular way. Okay. Uh, and that's kind of a big deal. I mean, you know, we could sit down at a table in person, we could talk about our families, but, you know, Jesus could sit there and say, hey, look, God is my father. And he could say that in a way that no one else among us could actually say that's kind of a big deal you know um i mean it's, it's apart from like adam you know uh you know i mean god uh you know only has like one son like this okay uh, so god functions as the father of jesus mary is his mother and matthew's very careful to not say that joseph is uh jesus's father because joseph is just married to mary no relation or no pun in those words. Okay. Um, all right. So um, the angel continues and says, uh, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for um, he will save his people from their sins. Okay. Um, uh, the, the word uh, Jesus' name in Hebrew uh, means uh, Yeshua, um, which uh, which which involves um, the name of God Yahweh, uh, but it also has the sense of Yahweh saving or Yahweh uh, delivers. So of course the name you see the name of Jesus. You're going to name him Jesus because he's going to save people. Well, that's because the name Yeshua involves uh, the verb uh, to save and deliver. Okay, all right, um, and so that's that's what happens. So so we have the that particular birth narrative. Uh, and, and again, Matthew, he spends a lot of time proving to you that Jesus, after all these names, after 40 names, did legitimately descend from David. So he can be called the Messiah, he can be called the Christ, and he descended from Abraham, meaning he's the person that's going to fulfill the Abrahamic promises of bringing a blessing to the world that deals with the world's curse. And of course, that gives meaning to the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus um, deals with the curse of humanity. By bringing a blessing. Okay, um, so that's the that's the the circumstances in regard to uh, Jesus um, uh, being born. I mean, he's, he's he's brought into existence through the creative power of God's Spirit. Okay, um, of course, Mark doesn't tell us anything about this because um, Mark just probably just doesn't have access to this sort of information, or it's not relevant to his story. But clearly, Matthew has he, he devotes what we would say an entire chapter to this particular point. Let me see how we're doing on on time here. Okay, we'll go for uh, maybe about um, fifteen more minutes, and then we'll take a break. Okay, uh, I want to move to to chapter two because the the young life of Jesus, um, like while he's like two years old, uh, continues to be discussed. Um, in, in this chapter. So uh, we get this sort of conflict because we see that that Jesus is, I mean, he's born to be the king. He's born to be the king of the Jews, the Messiah. Um, but when Jesus is born, there already is a king. And that king is Herod, Herod the Great. Um, and Herod uh, was not viewed by many of the Jewish people as a legitimate king because Herod did not uh, descend um, from Jews. Like, like his uh, one of his parents was an Edomite meaning he was not a descendant of Abraham, and he was not from the line of David. Uh, so while he was installed as king by Rome, uh, many people didn't take him very seriously, but um, he, Herod was known as a megalomaniac that um, uh, was was really afraid of uh, people trying to like take over his power, so he was known in history for like murdering many of his family members. It's not good. I mean, he, he's, he's not a... We call him Herod the Great, but man, he's like Herod the not so great. 
Okay. Um, and we talked about this a little bit too, because um, in Matthew chapter two, it's going to tell how Herod dies. Uh, and we know from Roman history, pretty clearly, we can date that Herod died in 4 BC. Okay, it's a very important date. You should know that Herod the Great died in 4 BC. And uh, we're going to see that that helps us to, to give a dating for the birth of Jesus. So what do we learn here in Matthew chapter 2? After Jesus uh, was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, magi, these are just people who are interested in magical arts, from the east arrived in Jerusalem. Okay, so if they are magi from the east, are they Jews? No, they're not. Okay, uh, they are. They're they're non-Jews. They are Gentiles. They're interested in magical arts, uh, but they these are these are Gentiles uh, coming uh, to Jerusalem. And what are they saying? Okay, um, they're saying, uh, "Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him." So these uh, magi are interested in. Um, in astronomy, they're looking at stars and they're following stars and they think that, okay, we see some sort of star in the sky and they, they follow it and they're looking for the king of the Jews. Now, uh, this, this creates some conflict. I mean, Jesus is, you know, a few months old and there's already conflict because these people are coming to Herod and they're saying, hey, Herod, king of the Jews, where is the newborn? And, uh, you know, so the question is, who is really the king? Who is really in charge? Okay, so before even Jesus is able to like speak and administer to anybody, his messianic status and his role as the king is already creating conflict. Okay, that's that's kind of what we're we're seeing here, and we can already we can already see that Jesus is attracting followers, um, even among people that are not necessarily Jewish people. All right, so when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him, okay? Herod doesn't want to lose his power. You can understand that, because Herod is known for uh, murdering people that threaten his power, okay? Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he, this is Herod, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born, okay? So Herod says, hey, all of you guys that know your Bibles really well, um, where is the Messiah supposed to be born, okay? And they, they go back and look in what we would call the Old Testament. For them, they would just call it the Hebrew Bible, because that's that's all the Bible that they had. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And then they're going to quote the Old Testament. Remember the old, when, when this translation quotes the Old Testament, they put everything in all caps. Doesn't mean they're yelling at you. It's just that's how they designate that the Old Testament's being quoted. So they're quoting from the, the prophet. Uh, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Okay, so there's a prophecy here that that uh, that's actually uh, spoken to a, a city, to Bethlehem, um, that uh, and it says that out of you is going to come a ruler, going to be a, come a king, and this person is going to shepherd the people. Okay, uh, shepherding, of course, uh, is an imagery of someone who is a uh, a, a a guide. And a comforter of sheep, but also the shepherd is a is a title for the king because King David was a shepherd king. Okay, and so ruling well was sometimes understood in terms of shepherding. Like a shepherd uh, would would uh, would rule the sheep and would guide and direct them, and a king would also um, rule over the quote unquote sheep. Okay, uh, so to shepherd the people is to mean to to rule well over the people uh, by uh, calling back to David in his own lifetime. Okay. All right. So that's, so, the, so Herod is asking, Hey, where is the Messiah going to be born? They say, well, the old Testament says it's going to be in Bethlehem. Okay. Small little city. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. So Herod is, um, again, if everything you know about Herod knows that he's up to no good. We see that he's doing something secretly. Um, and he's trying to figure out, okay, when did you see the star? Because I need to know how long it's been since the Messiah has been born. Okay, because Herod wants to determine the age of the Messiah. Why? Well, we're going to see. And then he sent to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report him to me, so that I too may come and worship him. 
Now, does Herod really want to go and worship Jesus the king? No, he doesn't. Okay, Herod wants to know where he is so that he can go and murder him, and that Herod can maintain his own uh, position as the king. Okay, so we can see that the life of Jesus is already uh, threatened in the story, uh, and Herod is, is using these people uh, as his pawns in order to do so. All right. After hearing the king, they, the Magi, went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. Okay, so the star um, leads them to where Jesus is. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That means that they were really, 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 really happy. Really, 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 really happy. Rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Um, I mean, it's just it's just the strongest superlative you can make. Very happy. Okay, they came into the house, and they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Okay, notice how he doesn't say, and Joseph, his father. It's just Mary's the mother. Okay, and they fell to the ground and they worshipped him. Notice here that uh, we talked about this before that the king, the human king it, in the ancient world, is worthy of worship. Okay, uh, they didn't confuse the king with the God of Israel. You could worship exalted figures. That's fine. Uh, it's, worship was used much more uh, flexibly in their culture than it is used in our culture. In our culture, we think you only worship God, but in their culture, um, you could worship high-ranking uh, people. Uh, there were some uh, some wives that worshipped their husbands, okay? Uh, which, depending on your perspective, is either a good thing or a bad thing. But the point is, like, uh, high-ranking um, human beings uh, were worthy of worship in a way that didn't um, cause any offense uh, to the one true God. So they fell down, and they worshipped this child, okay? So uh, the Magi are demonstrating that they are acknowledging the true kingship of Jesus, not the kingship of Herod. That's the whole question. Who is really the king? Well, the Magi say that Jesus is the king. And so they present to him treasures, uh, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, this is in interesting here. We have not been told how many Magi are present, but uh, the, the, the Christmas stories uh, they always picture it as three, three magi. And why do they say three magi? Because there's three gifts. There's a gift of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But it doesn't actually tell you how many there are. Um, but that's kind of the way it is. Uh, it's just kind of, uh, that's the way the story is is actually told. But, but to be fair, that this, uh, Matthew does not tell you how many there are. We just know that there's more than one because the plural is used. Okay. It could be three, but it could be, it could be 20. We, we just don't know. Okay. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left um, for their own country by another way. Okay, uh, so of course, uh, so so now it's the second time that uh, that 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 God is is talking to people in dreams. Okay, the first time we saw was in chapter one, where God sent an angel to talk to Joseph in a dream um, to indicate the will of God, and now we see that. Uh, um, the dream indicates to the Magi they should not go back to Herod. If they go back to Herod, um, they'll reveal where Jesus is. And that's going to put Jesus' life in jeopardy, and then um, that's not good. So they leave. Okay, uh, they, you know, they. It, it's clear again that they're owing their allegiance to Jesus and not to Herod. Uh, now, when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. So now go the third time. The dream's taking place, and said. Um, so the, the angel's talking to Joseph now. Again, notice the perspective uh, is from it's from the perspective of Joseph, not from Mary. Um, and the angel says, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Okay, so Jesus' life is in jeopardy. They're told to leave Bethlehem and to go to Egypt. Where's Egypt in comparison to everything? Egypt is south. Okay, very far. All right, so they, they go, they take this long journey south. Okay, uh, so Joseph got up and he took the child and his mother, and while it was still night, he left for Egypt. Okay, so there's a sense here to where there's an urgency. It's the middle of the night. They're sleeping. I mean, Joseph wakes up in the middle of the night. He's like, hey, Mary, uh, you're not going to believe this. I had this dream. It's crazy. I was told by God to get up and to take the child and leave. And so in the middle of the night, they grab everything they own and they pack up and they leave for Egypt. 
I mean, there's a sense of urgency that's there, but there's also a sense to where Joseph is, he's being obedient. He's being faithful. He's doing what he is told. Okay. All right. Uh, he, Joseph, he remained there. He remained in Egypt until the death of Herod. This is to fulfill what is spoken by the Lord, the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Here's an interesting thing. Um, so Matthew, we're starting to see Matthew likes to say that this little part of the story of Jesus is in fulfillment of this Old Testament passage. Now, I want, I want to kind of tell you what's what's happening in this Old Testament passage because it shows the flexibility that Matthew has in using his quotations. Okay. Um, so this quotation comes out of an Old Testament prophet named Hosea. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Okay. You don't need to know that reference. Okay. But if you go back in Hosea, the reference of out of Egypt I called my son is a reference to the Exodus story when I, namely God, called my son, which is a reference to the nation of Israel out of Egypt. That's what happened in the book of Exodus when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. So in the original quotation, um, the calling out of Egypt of God's son was the, the exodus from Egypt by the sons of God, namely the nation of Israel. And what's happening here is that now it's being used in a completely new way. Obviously, Jesus leaving Egypt is not the same thing as the Israelites leaving Egypt, you know, 1,200 years earlier, okay? And the reference to the sun in the original quotation, which is a reference to Israel as a nation, is now being used of Jesus as the sun. So what do we see there? We see Jesus is being described as a son who uh, gives further meaning to what it means to be Israel. Israel is an entire nation, a group of people, and now it's being represented by one particular person, by Jesus. Okay, So here's the point. It's like when Matthew is using these quotations, it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, meaning. Okay, Out of Egypt I called my son, and this old thing is about the book of Exodus, God calling the Israelites. Okay, Son of God is a reference there to the Israelites. But when Matthew uses it, it's about a new coming out of Exodus that's going to happen uh, with Jesus. And Jesus takes the title Son of God, okay, which makes him a one-person representative of all the nation of Israel. But we know this already. We already know that Son of God is a title for the king. And the king, of course, is the person who represents all of his people. Okay, so so Jesus functions as a representative figure, but again, it's, it's very important that you should know for your notes that uh, that many of these quotations are not meant to be one to one, you know, uh, you know, line by line interpretations. Okay, the reference to Egypt is different, the the timing is different, uh, the understanding of son is different, but but it's 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 showing that Jesus is doing something similar. And it also indicates that Jesus is the Son of God who represents Israel as a whole. Okay? All right. Um, and the next verse tells us some very interesting historical information. Uh, then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged, and he sent and he slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all the vicinity from two years old and under. According to the time, which he had determined from the Magi. Okay, uh, so Herod decides. Okay, from based on the time that I, I learned when the star appeared, it's been about two years. Okay, so the only way to make sure that we we get rid of Jesus, let's just kill all the two year olds and younger. Okay, now shortly afterwards, a couple verses later, we learn that Herod dies. So Herod dies immediately after this particular point. Okay, so if we know that Herod died from history, in the year 4 BC, and if Herod tried to murder children that were two years old and younger, then you add two years to that, and it's likely that Jesus was born in 6 BC, or really technically anywhere between 6 and 4 BC, if you want it to be accurate, okay? That's how we get, that's how we date uh, the birth of Jesus. I know it's a little weird, 
to say Jesus was born in six years before Christ. I know I understand that's weird. That's because the people who uh, came up with our modern dating system that then they try to base it around the year when Jesus was born. Uh, they got it wrong by a little bit. Um, okay, like humans make mistakes. I get it. Okay, but you do need to know that Jesus um, was born probably somewhere between six and four BC. But Herod, for for certain, was born or sorry, was killed in four BC. Okay, um, so so we've already seen that in chapter one and chapter two, which deal with the birth narratives of Jesus, that they are framing Jesus as a king. He is the Messiah. He is the Jewish king. And he's already he's already uh, calling controversy. He's already uh, in need of protection from God. Um, but we're also seeing that he is gathering people that are going to acknowledge him as the king. They're going to worship him as the king. They're going to cons- they're going to say, you're the king. But Herod or anyone that Rome uh, appoints, that person is a false king. Jesus, you're the true king. OK. All right. Um, what else do we need to see? Um, by the end of this passage, by the way, uh, they, um, we, we know that when Herod dies, um, his, his actually his territory and his kingdom gets divided, um, between, uh, three of his sons. Um, and one of them actually is not a very good son. He actually kind of took after his, his father. So we learned down in verse 22, one of his sons is a guy named Archelaus. Okay. Um, so when he, this is when, um, when Joseph heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. So, so Joseph was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God, guess when, in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. And then of course, that's where they live in Nazareth, according to the next verse. And Jesus is raised in Nazareth. Okay. Um, so God communicates through all these dreams, but now that God is talking to Joseph, okay? God's not talking to Mary here. God's talking to Joseph because Matthew is framing the birth of Jesus from the perspective of Joseph, okay? And so in the next chapter, in chapter three, it's just going to begin with uh, John the Baptist baptizing Jesus, 